Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for another installment of the research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research, to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructure for sharing best practices. Before we introduce today's presenters and the topic of their presentation, an important disclaimer for our research webinar series. This webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information, which do not necessarily reflect those of Michigan Virtual or MVLRI and are not given nor endorsed by MV or MVLRI unless otherwise specified. Today, we are very excited to have with us Dr. Jared Borup back again after his Friday webinar <laughs> with <Yeah>. Charles Graham. <laughs> He's a regular uh, with Dr. Shawana Chambers and Rebecca Stimson from our team here at MVLRI to talk about their research on students to understand their perspectives on teachers and mentors as online learning supports. Jared Borup is the professor in charge of the blended and online learning in schools, masters and certificate programs that are devoted to improving teacher practices in online and blended learning environments. Previous to earning his PhD at Brigham Young University, Jared taught history at a junior high school for six years. He has also taught online and blended courses since 2008. His current research interests include developing online learning communities and identifying support systems that are adolescent learners require to be successful in online environments. We also have Dr. Shawana Bethany Chambers, whose birthday it is today. So happy birthday to her. And she I did is... not know. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to sing at the end of the webinar. <laughs> you didn't get an invitation to the party, I guess. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Chambers is a national award-winning and board-certified PK-20 career educator with teaching experience spanning primary, secondary, and higher education. Shwana's professional responsibilities have included traditional and online classroom teaching, curriculum development, project management, teacher supervision, instructional coaching, public speaking, board service, and program administration. In 2016, she founded Single Seed Enrichment School, Inc., a 501c3 educational nonprofit dedicated to enhancing the educational experiences of pre-K through 12th grade students in San Antonio, Texas. We also have Rebecca Stimson joining us from Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, um, where she joined in 2012. Um, Rebecca has English education credentials and a BA in Urban Development, Urban Education from Michigan State University. In addition, she earned an MA in Educational Policy Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She taught personalized developmental reading and writing at Lansing Community College for six years and has over 25 years of experience writing and editing for a variety of audiences. So I am going to hand it over to them. Thank you so much for joining us. And welcome everyone and glad to see everybody. Some of you have had the opportunity to tell us who you are. So those of you who have not, if you would please add to the chat box your name and affiliation and your current role and uh, your connection to student support. I'm going to give you a minute to do that. And I know there's going to be a flurry of activity. But it's always, it's always good, as, since I'm the writer, I like to know um, who my audience is, and it's always helpful for us as presenters to know uh, what your point of view might be. We hope that you will uh, put your questions into the chat box as they come up, and Catherine will be helping to monitor that. So uh, this is the uh, discussion about the third uh, and fourth reports in a four report series, uh, Helping Students Succeed series. For this webinar, as I say, our focus is on the last two, which is uh, student perceptions of online teacher and on-site mentor instructional and facilitation support. The links for all of these reports will be shared at the end of the slide deck. 
So uh, to give you a little context, uh, one of the ways that um, the state has mandated um, uh, something that will that we believe leads to the student success is this mentor requirement. So all online learners are assigned a mentor who is employed by what would be considered the student's home school and that person's responsibility is to support the students throughout their online experience. We um, make a distinction between a mentor and a monitor. Their, their purpose is not to monitor per se, but they do monitor progress. They help support with um, the student in any uh, concerns or, or challenges that the student has uh, uh, throughout the um, length of the course, whether it be working with the uh, online um, uh, or I'm sorry, the learning management system or in communicating with the teacher, that kind of thing. Um, mentors vary greatly in their experience and in their other roles at the school. Many of them uh, fulfill other roles in addition to being a mentor from the assistant principal to a uh, paraprofessional. So uh, uh, as I say, there's quite a deal of a great deal of uh, variety in terms of who the mentors are. So Jared is going to talk a little bit more about uh, mentors and their effect on the students. Great, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, ha I'm happy that we have some online teachers here, uh, a couple, Yolanda and, and Christine. Um, great. So anyone that's taught online knows that um, it can be pretty challenging. Um, oftentimes students underestimate uh, the workload that it'll be. And not only that, uh, what people tend to, to misunderstand is that learning online depends really heavily on students' ability to be motivated, to be self-directed, and to really take responsibility for their individual learning, which as we know is not always the case with teenagers. And so because of that, if we go down to the next slide, Um, we know that uh, what's particularly challenging with students who are new to online learning is not only do they have to learn the content in the course, right, but they also have to learn how to learn online. They have to learn the process of learning online at the same time. So uh, you can also look at that as kind of a, they're really taking a course and a half at the same time, uh, which is, is particularly challenging. Now, online teachers, we know, can form really strong relationships with students. Uh, we, we performed uh, a previous study where we interviewed online teachers, um, and we found that they were highly engaged uh, with students and, and providing them with quality feedback, answering their questions, being really responsive, and even kind of developing these close relationships with them, um, with, with some that were willing to kind of engage in that way. Uh, but we also know that forming these relationships can be more time consuming than, than we see in a face-to-face -face context. And because uh, teacher lows are so high, students can, can actually disappear. So this, is, this actually isn't that big of a, a student load um, for, for many online courses, but you can imagine if, if you're a teacher and you have students in all these different buildings, and you're trying to uh, communicate with them and, and you're really responsible for both teaching them the content and teaching them how to learn online, it can be, become quite overwhelming and you can see why some students kind of fall through the cracks and, and disappear, especially when they want to disappear. Okay, so um, again, th this, is, this is what teachers are kind of working with. Uh, you'll have students in several buildings. Um, there will be parents at, at home or guardians at home. And so in, in some models, the teacher are, is not only responsible for communicating with students, but they're also responsible for communicating with, with parents. Okay, let's click down. Um, oftentimes parents are not really present uh, or guardians aren't really present to support students, which can make it even more challenging for students and teachers. So that's why mentors are, are such a critical player in this, um, because they act as a communication link um, between students and teachers at times, but also with, with parents to kind of get them involved. And they're also there face-to-face -face working with students. 
And even if you have a parent that's involved, oftentimes they don't know much about online learning, or maybe they took an online course a decade ago or, or whatever. Um, and so they, they can provide support, but they oftentimes they don't know how to be involved. And so mentors, they're not experts in the content always, but they are experts or, or we anticipate that they should be experts in the process of learning online. So when you've got a, a mentor, an active mentor in a building, um, teachers can focus on uh, student mastery of the content, and then they let mentors kind of handle the process of learning online. Now, clearly there's overlap between those roles too. Okay, let's go down. So previously, uh, we, we published some uh, research on the role of the, the role of the mentor. So this is the handbook. It's a resource that's uh, publicly available. Um, uh, Catherine was uh, the co-editor of that. And I, I wonder, Catherine, if you could add that to the chat as well. We, uh, we have a chapter in, in the handbook on mentors that kind of covers all the research. Um, specific to Michigan and MVLRI, we published a, a report on mentor responsibilities. And this is the one that included um, interviews with teachers and, um, and mentors that we purposefully sampled across the state, uh, which really highlighted the importance of mentors and, and teachers kind of working together. Um, we also published a report using those same interviews to better understand how can parents be involved with uh, mentors and with teachers. Okay. Again, those links, well, they're in the chat, but they'll also be uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay. So we were gonna talk a little bit with you about the, the methods. Um, I'm gonna go back to that other slide for a moment. These, the, the Helping Online Students Be Successful reports one and two, as Jared said, we, we interviewed uh, mentors first. We selected 12 mentors. We'll get into a little bit more uh, detail about that. And then they recommended the names of teachers. And uh, we took the, like the top 10 or 12 of the teachers that, that the mentors had recommended to talk to as, as being those who um, uh, provided particularly uh, good, had particularly good relationships with the mentors and the students. So in this case, for this, uh, this, these two reports, um, we, identified, we, we identified three mentors from particularly successful programs who then identified students for us to interview in these focus groups. The parents and students gave their consent. Um, we, we thought that, that the students that we were choosing would be comfortable sharing their experience and their perceptions in a group setting. And then the parents and students were provided a description of the research protocol and the intent and gave their consent. While we preferred the groups to be six to eight participants, there was so much interest at two of the schools that we had 10 in one particular group and the groups in general ranged from four to 10. Uh, there were two facilitators, uh, one my colleague Justin Bruno who led three of the eight focus groups and then I facilitated the other five. We followed a protocol that had about 40 questions including follow-up uh, which were all covered uh, in, a, in an hour or so although we found that of course once the students got going they had a lot to say and it was hard to hard to stop talking with them because how often do you get to sit in a room with four or five well, if you're not a teacher <laughs> how often do you get to be in the presence of of you know f four to ten teenagers who really want to tell you what their experience is so that was great we provided pizza to them uh, those sessions were recorded and transcribed and then those um responses were coded and Shawana is going to talk about that because she uh, had uh, primary responsibility for that initially. So the sampling uh, took place and this took place at the beginning uh, of before that first report was written obviously we sampled 12 schools with very high online pass rates uh, and you can see they uh, we got a, an equal distribution there of urban suburban town and, and rural and you can see where they uh, were across the state 
the average student load was 95. The, the loads ranged from 15 to 300 for those 12 mentors schools that we sampled. Obviously, um, the, uh, in the situation of someone who has a, a, or a school where there's a load of 300 students, there are, uh, typically are more than one mentor, uh, although much of the mentor role may be fulfilled by parapros, as I mentioned before. Uh, interestingly, 11 of these high-performing programs held daily labs, and the 12th had weekly labs. So meaning that the students in 11 of the schools met in a lab, and then the, the school that had a weekly lab, they only had to be in that lab once a week. Uh, the teacher participants, as I mentioned before, were uh, recommended to us by the mentors, and we did have more than one um, uh, mentor recommend most of the 12 teachers that we spoke to. The student participants, as I said before, came from three schools, and uh, we uh, collected 70 surveys, so there were more students that uh, completed a survey than we actually met with in the focus group. Uh, and then we had eight focus groups that were a total of 51 students. And Jared is going to comment on the survey findings. Yeah, so I mean, student voice was really lacking in previous research. Um, it's included in, in some spots, but uh, we're really excited that we're able to get so much student participation and, and by doing focus groups, um, it actually turned out really nice uh, as far as getting students to, to bounce ideas off each other and to share their experiences that way. But the, the survey uh, was really just trying to get um, some understanding of, of the support that they're receiving and, and how common that support was. So one thing that I'll say is uh, what's highlighted in yellow here um, I don't know if I can have a pointer or not in Zoom. I guess I guess not. Um, but what, what's in what's in yellow uh, is is basically those things. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, what what's in yellow are those support indicators where the teacher uh, was was most commonly the source of that support. So that makes sense. Like, for instance, explain things when you had questions, right? So, so that makes sense, especially if you're asking about the content or reviewed policies, expectations. Uh, some of these were much, much higher, for instance, like providing feedback. So, so we'd expect those things to happen. Um, also, what was, what was kind of surprising is uh, helped you learn how to communicate with others online. Um, I think we're kind of expecting mentors to play a larger role with that, but it, it felt like uh, teachers were kind of, fulfilling that responsibility. But overall, out of the 70, only 32 students reported receiving that uh, support indicator. The other things where the, the mentors were really the source of the support um, were, the, were the top two. Uh, we can see that you know, they checked in with them, make sure that they were working hard, kind of motivating them, making sure that, that they were on track, um, or check their grades or progress regularly. And maybe this is more uh, visible for students um, because when in our interviews with teachers, they were also kind of tracking really carefully uh, with, with student grades, but, but it's, it's not always easy for, for teachers to recognize that. So it's important to know that we're, rec we're really looking at student perceptions here. Your turn, okay. Shawana. You might need to unmute if you're muted. There we go. It wouldn't let me unmute. Sorry. Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess because I wasn't in control of the thing. Um, so, um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the different areas that we uh, focused our um, questions on with our students. Uh, we had advising, orienting, and troubleshooting, uh, facilitating communication, building relationships, monitoring and motivating student progress, organizing and managing, and then instructing. Uh, so with advising, um, one of the, the things that came out the most about the advising area was that the on-site mentors did quite a bit of the advising for the students who initially wanted it. 
Um, so we had some students uh, reported that they just kind of decided they wanted to take an online class, so they did it, um, as Sharon says here. It's like, oh, I want to do this, let's go. And so they didn't really have much advising uh, and didn't really ask any type of adults for information. Um, other students reported that they did talk to maybe the principal or a school counselor or maybe a parent, um, but the vast majority of those who reported uh, seeking advisement from someone went to their on-site mentor. Um, and particularly these people because uh, they knew a lot about the student and could recommend specific things because of the relationship that they had already built. What we did find was there, there were, you know, a lot of teachers, obviously online teachers who participated in the advising piece because this is at the beginning when students are just now registering. With orienting and troubleshooting, a lot of the students talked about unit zero which is something that MVLRI has added to um, the classes. And so you have to go through unit zero in order to access any of the other work um, that you have for a course. Um, and so this particular tool was designed to um, make sure the students do the expectations and the requirements and those types of things. Of course, a couple of students mentioned plagiarism and making sure that, um, well, the on-site uh, or the on-site mentor as well as the teacher would talk through about you know here are the expectations in terms of what we expect um, you to do your own work and not copy and those types of things um, also it would make sure like i said that the student had to follow all of these pieces before they could move on to their class content so that they would know okay here's how you check for the pacing guide um, here's how you you know if you need to contact your teacher here your online teacher here's the way you do that um, what we did notice or what students did report is that they tended to ask their online teacher if they had technical issues um, that were going on uh, with the online class, even if it wasn't the learning management system. Uh, sometimes they found that their, their um, um, on-site mentors were not as well versed in the tech aspects of the courses and things, and so they would ask their online teacher for support with those things. Uh, when it came to facilitating communication, you know, of course, there's the on-site mentor and then there's the online teacher piece. Some students said that they were able to, you know, you could just email your teacher and get the answer that you needed. And um, it, depending on the class that you were taking, the students could ask the question and then move on to something else and then come back to it once the instructor responded. Whereas you see here, Jessica said, you know, hey, it's kind of frustrating because I can't go on because I'm in a different type of course. And so it's essential for my teacher to answer this question. Otherwise, I can't move forward. Some students also reported that they felt kind of weird about emailing or they didn't like communicating through email. They liked that face-to-face -face communication or over the phone. Um, and so for some students, the communicating with their online teacher went okay, went well, but for others, they struggled because of the amount of time that they had to wait to get um, to get to their to get to their instructor and for that reason they ended up talking more so to their on-site mentor so within their interactions with the on-site mentor like i said uh, because the students were face to face with their mentors or they were already in the building with them they would more frequently go to the on-site mentor for questions than they would that online teacher especially if it was something that they really needed an answer to pretty immediately uh, because generally you know teachers have about 24 hours or so to get back to students and so that for the students for a lot of students was a long time to wait for certain answers um, with the on-site mentors uh, and having the lab the required lab they would be right there with the the mentor and they could ask the questions or get whatever kind of feedback and they also several of the students reported that their mentors were just you know generally wanted to help them and they liked you know going and talking to these people and so for for a lot of our students the on-site mentor was that that chief person that they were facilitating that communication with in addition to that mentors did try to encourage their students to talk to their online teachers and did try to encourage them to send the email to the teacher and could sometimes give the students here's how you ask this type of question um, building relationships so with the online teachers, some of the students did um, discuss and, and liked developing relationships with their teachers. They said when teachers would disclose, you know, information about themselves, like about them being parents and, 
you know, maybe their child was sick and they were going to be out for a little bit, that that helped to humanize them. Um, the students, you know, would say, oh, they, they helped me feel like they were a real person. And they like that. Um, they like the bitmojis or the little emojis that the teachers would use on the announcement boards or in their messages. Um, they gave, that gave off to a lot of kids um, an element of friendliness. Um, and they just, some of the, student, the teachers would ask how students are doing, just how was your day? How was your weekend? Or they got to know them and knew that they were football players or they were cheerleaders, et cetera. And the, the teacher would ask about those things. And so uh, students reported that they liked that type of uh, interaction with, their, with their, their online teacher because it helped humanize them and give them uh, more of a connection so they'd be more willing to ask them questions and communicate with them. Um, so on the opposite of that, um, we did also have some students that reported that they didn't have a lot of meaningful interaction with their teachers. And so they didn't have strong relationships or connections with their online teachers. Um, you know, one student, Gina here says that um, her teacher didn't really communicate with her unless there was a problem. And so there wasn't, you know, that type of relationship of just how are you doing? How are things going? How can I help you? Wasn't really there. It's just more so you need to fix this thing. Here's how you do it. Um, a couple of students did also use the term robot when they were referring to their online teacher um, for, you know, different reasons, but they just felt like uh, they didn't really have that human interaction piece with the online teacher. And so they, you know, it was kind of just distant. Um, a couple of students also did say that there wasn't necessarily a need to build a relationship with their online teacher because all the online teacher does in the students view is just grade my work. And so they weren't really asking the online teacher to develop that relationship and they weren't, you know, they weren't necessarily closed off to it, but for them, it just wasn't a necessity for them to be successful in the class. Um, and so, you know, Sandy here says, what's the point of building a relationship? They're not really going to get to know you well. Um, and that was, you know, students were saying some things like that, but also mostly referring to the part that they've got teachers who are face to face with them and they have teachers that they can just go into their classrooms. And so for some of the students, just building that online connection was, was too difficult or not necessary. So in contrast, their relationships and connections with their on-site mentors were extremely strong. Um, they, you know, one school in particular, the kids just raved about their mentor and how much he really, really cared about them and was invested in who they were as individuals on a personal level and really just cared about what they, uh, what they wanted to do and what, and any kind of issues they were having. One, you know, Cynthia says that her, you know, her mentor is really good at the nonverbal cues. And a lot of that is, you know, you can do that when you're face to face, but it was that online piece um, that made it difficult for a lot of them to have these same kinds of relationships with their online teachers. When it came to monitoring and motivating students, um, there were some differences there. Um, some students felt like their teachers monitor their grades just like a face-to-face -face teacher would. Um, some of one student, Sage here, says that she knows that her teacher was um, monitoring her progress because she would get personal information, personal messages about her efforts and how she was doing in the class. Um, and so then you have the, up, the other side of it where the student feels like the instructor didn't care that they had fallen behind as long as they're grading the work and that type of thing. And so uh, this also, I think it has a lot more to do with who is the instructor, what is the course that they're doing, um, and because the students were giving different information um, and having talking about different experiences with that motivating factor. With their on-site mentors um, across the board, they all felt like they're, they're, or the ones who talked about it reported that their mentor definitely monitored them and monitored their grades, it would come and find them if something, if they're, they were behind pace, would, um, they would have, uh, they'd have to come to lab and couldn't go somewhere else if they weren't where they needed to be. And so there were some consequences um, when they were behind. And if they needed to contact parents, they, you know, the mentor would make sure that, you know, things were going on and, and that they had contacted the parent and made sure the parent knew so that they could um, get the support system together for the students. But again, the students felt like their on-site mentors were really invested in who they were and they respected who they were 
And so that was a motivating factor for the kids because of the mentor and feeling that the mentor cared so much, the students didn't want to um, upset the mentor and didn't want to let them down. And so they would do the work because they wanted to make their mentor proud. Um, and then for organizing and managing, um, the lab time came up quite a bit with students. Uh, the majority of the students who talked about it felt like it was beneficial to have that lab time. Some students who didn't think it was beneficial for them still felt like it was important for other students who needed that extra push or who needed um, that outside, that um, external motivation to get something done. Uh, Stephanie, you know, she says, uh, you just feel like there's a drive to stay focused when you're in the room with other people watching you and, and they're doing work. And so you want to make sure that you're also doing it. Um, and their mentors were there in lab time. So it made them want to do what they were supposed to be doing because their mentor was watching them. And the last one here is instructing uh, the online teachers. This is the, I mean, for a lot of students, this is where they felt like that's what the online teacher was for. All the other stuff, maybe not so much, but for the instruction piece, uh, the instructors either did videos, made video feedback or had videos um, for the students to help them. And that was something that the students appreciated. Um, they responded to emails, though it did take some time for some of the students and was a little bit frustrating in terms of the amount of time that it took, they did respond uh, to what they needed. Um, and then they give really specific instructions uh, for those students who had good feedback from instructors. Uh, they felt like they could do better and they could, um, they could progress because their instructors were actually responding to them and reading their work. On the other side, so when we look at when we looked at feedback specifically, there were some discrepancies with that. Some students reported having amazing feedback from their instructors, very detailed, all of the assignments, they knew exactly what to change and, and what to do to do better. And then other students felt like their feedback was generic and it was, oh, good job, or you did great here with very little effort put into um, the specifics of what the student could do better or what the student actually had done well. And so some students even said, um, I know that when I turned in this assignment, I didn't put all of my effort or really any effort into this. And I got good job, great work. And because of that, that made them feel like the teachers were either not reading their work uh, fully or they just weren't, they didn't care about the level of work that the students were putting in. I think this is I'm here. <laughs> here we go. All right. Uh, yeah, so I when when we talk about what what can we interpret from this and and what can we apply and use um, I, I feel like it's obvious we need more research. Um, this was uh, while we had lots of student participants this this was a context where students were working with mentors in a lab setting, right? Um, but we can definitely get some insights uh, regardless of our, our context as well. We just can't generalize the findings. Um, but more research is needed, especially with less engaged mentors. Um, again, these, these mentors were sampled because they were so highly engaged and they weren't typical. Um, we also know that, that there are some mentors that are disengaged or kind of um, they, they become involved when they perceive a need or, or something like that, but they don't maintain such a high level of support. And so future research should kind of see, you know, um, what, what is more typical uh, for students. Uh, but this research kind of provided us an opportunity to see what's possible with, with highly engaged mentors. Um, the other thing that we found is that students didn't feel a high need to develop relationships with the online teacher. And again, maybe that's because they already had such a close caring relationship with their mentor that they didn't feel a need to develop one with the online teacher as much, which may be different in, in different settings. Um, that's not to say they didn't want to have some type of relationship or, or a word that came up a lot was trust. They wanted to be able to trust the online teacher. And so teachers, regardless of the context, should still be developing that. But if, if you're an online teacher and you know that two, 
uh, some students don't have a very engaged mentor. Maybe it's, it's a smart choice to kind of focus your attention on developing relationships with those students. Because as we said earlier, it, it's time consuming to develop those relationships. Um, and so it, it might be the rational choice if, if they know that there's a highly involved mentor not to, to focus as much on those students in that aspect. Um, the other thing is that mentors and teachers can coordinate their efforts better. So, so similar to what I was saying, if, if you kind of know that there's a highly engaged mentor, maybe teachers could prioritize their time uh, differently um, or, or know what, what types of supports uh, they need to address and, and what's being addressed by the mentor. Um, the other thing that came up that was really helpful for teachers was that unit zero. The only drawback that we really heard about the unit zero um, which again kind of oriented them to the learning environment was if you were taking multiple courses, it became really redundant and kind of boring to have to go through it over and over and over again. Um, so one possible solution for that is to develop a badging system where that, with that. So if, if students kind of take that unit zero, they're badged in it, and that badge might be good for three years or whatever, then they don't have to keep reviewing the same, the same unit, they can just display the badge and, and get it passed off. Um, the other thing that we found that students really wanted was more on the spot support. Um, so that's te technological support with troubleshooting. If, if they had uh, issues with the technology, sometimes that could really hang them up. But in subject areas that are really skill based, such as math, um, it was hard for them to kind of move forward if they didn't have that on, on, the support, on the spot support. Now for online teachers, if you're also teaching uh, full time, clearly you're not gonna be online when maybe students are working online. And so it, it's unrealistic to kind of expect, especially the, the part-time instructors to be there all the time. Uh, but students still wanted some more of that on the spot support. So um, there are some different ways to do that. So for instance, there's a, personalized learning software that, that I'm aware of that uh, teaches math to students. Um, but when students get hung up, there's kind of a, a helpline that they can go to where they can contact a content expert that's kind of waiting, uh, that, that isn't the instructor or anything like that, but they know how to answer these, these specific questions about math, where maybe the person that is, is facilitating their learning face-to-face -face can't really support them in that way. Um, and it doesn't have to be the teacher, but they do have to know the, the subject area. Um, the other thing that came up quite a bit when we're talking about what should teachers focus on, quality feedback is huge. Uh, they, they felt like, again, if, if they just got a, a great job and, and that was it on some of these projects that they really spent a lot of time on, like these writing projects, uh, it was pretty disappointing. They, they want their work to be acknowledged in authentic ways. Um, they also want their communication to be timely. Um, so, so if it's a 24 hour guideline that they'll receive a response 24 hours, for the most part, uh, teachers were doing that, but there were some times when that didn't happen. And anyone that's taught online, myself included, uh, we, we know how hard it can be uh, to, to respond all the time. And sometimes I know myself, I'll check my email on my cell phone and then I think, oh, okay, I'll respond to that when I get to my laptop and then I forget to do it, right? Um, so there are some interesting tools that are coming up, like uh, anyone that uses Gchat or, or, or sorry, Google Mail or Gmail, um, they have this new feature now where if you get a question and you don't respond, then it'll kind of prompt you a few days later saying, hey, did you want to respond to this email? Which I use actually surprisingly a lot. Um, I thought I was really good at responding to emails, but the, you know, it feels like every couple of weeks I get one of those emails. And with these students, if they have to wait you know, three to four days, they're probably not as proactive at, at sending another email saying, hey, why haven't you responded? Or you know, I, I'm still waiting. Um, and even if they just have one or two of those experiences, it feels like from their perspective, um, it, it can kind of poison the well for, for them with, with their online experience. Um, so we, we really as online teachers need to be careful with that. Um, and hopefully there, there'll be some tools that are developed that will support teachers in, in that way. Um, the other thing is that uh, 
students wanted to, to get communication that made them know that uh, teachers were aware of their behavior. So if they have really strange learning schedules, although they're not, uh, you know, missing points or late points or anything like that, they kind of wanted the online teacher to check in and say, hey, I notice you haven't been online for three weeks. You know, is everything okay? Can I, can I help you with anything? So, so they, want, they want to be acknowledged and noticed. Um, which, he, and, and again, this was with really engaged mentors. So, so if you don't have an engaged mentor, it's probably even more important that online teachers are doing that. Um, the lab, having a lab time appeared to be especially important, but at the same time, uh, maybe that doesn't provide all students the opportunity to kind of develop independent learning skills, or if um, a mentor kind of swoops in and kind of uh, intervenes, you know, immediately whenever students have, have a struggle, then maybe that isn't good in, in other ways as well. Um, there, there was a book that I really liked that said that learning should be frustratingly pleasant, right? So we know that we kind of learn through these obstacles, and so we don't want to mow them all down. Um, and so, so it, it is possible that maybe mentors could be too involved as well. We also know that what, what teachers are tasked with and what on, online or on-site mentors are tasked with, it's complicated, it's complex. Um, and so they really need professional development in order to do it well. Uh, there was one researcher that said mentors are made, not born. And that's really true, uh, that, that they, they oftentimes are coming in, in to the position not having much experience with online learning at all. And so they really need to know what their roles should be. So, so we, we highly recommend that both online teachers and on-site mentors receive some professional development on how to fulfill their responsibilities, but also how to work together. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jared. <clears throat> so, um, this is the, the, the end really of the, of the uh, reporting on the research. The resources are here. As, as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the, the first two reports and then the second two reports are uh, just published actually this week, thanks to um, our fine Melissa in the office for getting those up for us. Thank you, Melissa. And um, now it's, it's your turn. Questions? We're all teachers, so we can wait. Hey, this is Joe. How are you guys? Hey, Joe. First, thank you so much for the presentation today and the work on this. It's been pretty fascinating to read the report and hear it presented today. Um, I have a, a, a handful of notes that are down, but I thought I'd start with a question about how do mentors shape the perceptions of online teachers. And, and um, you know, in, in the report and in the presentation, you talked a little bit about how students responded. Um, I don't remember if you said it specifically in here, but in some cases in the report talked about, you know, a robot or it would be weird to have an interaction with an online uh, teacher, want to have a relationship with an online teacher. And I was thinking just about the role that a mentor may play in, in helping to guide that, or as part of the mentor, you know, the, the, these students may have some resistance to them and how you might overcome it. So just a general question, what do you think the mentor's role could or should be as it pertains to shaping students' perceptions of the online teachers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in our previous study uh, where we were talking with, with more mentors and really we're getting um, better understanding what they were doing. One, one thing that we heard uh, is that they, they really set the expectations, right, for, for most everything. So I, I do remember conducting some interviews where uh, at least one mentor said that they, when students said, you know, that's kind of weird, they'd say, well, why is that, you know, they're, they're your teacher, don't you communicate with your teacher? You know, don't you get to know your teacher? So, so they, they would kind of have to walk them through that. Um, 
but from a student perspective, you can, you can understand why they're hesitant to communicate with someone they don't know online, right? Um, I mean, they're, they're always uh, being told to be, to be netwise and uh, to, to be safe online. Um, but I, I feel like the mentor could play a really important role in just letting them know, you know, this is, this is good. This is, this is important. Um, and, and kind of relate it back to something that students are familiar with, even though they might not be as familiar with communicating with, with um, adults online. You know, one of the things that it strikes me is that, um, you know, the students are aware of the, how the instructor interacts with them, but they don't necessarily see uh, how the inter instructor interacts with the mentor. And, um, you know, we did see some concerns about the amount of time that went by between when a student is communicated by from the instructor. And so possibly a strategy that mentors could use on that is to communicate as they're hearing from an instructor. Hey, you know, I you know, got an email from your instructor last night. I see you're doing well on X or Y, or your, your mentor, re your instructor reached out to me because he or she was concerned about this other piece. And, and so maybe if mentors were also to communicate to their students about how they interact with the online instructor, it would shape their perceptions in powerful ways that, the, that they are more actively involved and that they're taking a caring role for the child that, that just may not be transparent to them at first blush. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point because we did have one one student in the focus group base when we asked, you know, um, do you know if your uh, if your online teacher is communicating with your mentor? And and she said something like, "Oh, well, that would be weird," you know. Um, but but I, I I think it's just you know reassuring them that we're we're going to be doing this. That's the expectation, and here's why, and it's important, and it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, the second one of the second pieces I put down that I was thinking about, and Jared, I know we had talked about this um, during a run, if you will, uh, was about thinking about personalized learning and how much we talk about personalized learning in this field. But typically, when it's talked about, it has to do with content. And I'll give an example about that. You know, in credit recovery uh, programs in particular, there's a lot of focus on diagnostic tools that help you decide, you know, whether a student is supposed to. Um, take this particular module or unit or whether they already know it and, and move on. But one of the things I was thinking about from your piece was the, the diagnostics to determine what kind of a role the child expects the teacher to play, the online instructor to play. You know, at the beginning when they start off, what information is the teacher or the mentor gathering that helps them understand, at least the, at, the, at the outset, what is it that the child believes the role of the mentor and the instructor to be? Because that can be really powerful in either helping to reshape that role for the child or to, you know, to understand, hey, this child is going to need these kinds of things from me, but not these other type. And what, what would be the instrument that that would look like? Or you guys talked about unit zero. You know, would that be included in a unit zero or in some other way? that the, um, the program itself may take and collect that information that could really be useful for the child. So we just struck about the, the diagnostics and determining relationship um, factors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know, uh, Becky, what do you think? About what in particular? That was a pretty robust a, conversation. A, a diagnostic tool. What what might that look like? Where where would you include that? Or because there there is kind of a, a online learning readiness. Rubric, the, right? the online learning readiness rubric, yes. And then we have um, still OLA, the online learner um, orientation tool, that is being replaced by SOS. Actually, we have someone present, Jill, who worked on SOS as, a, as another um, a replacement, actually, for OLA. But I think the, I think the, um, what, what we've already sort of said, you know, that, that the students need that support, that interaction with with adult individuals who know them, who they trust, to um, 
to understand what it is that they are strong in, what it, what they need to uh, have reinforced, what their roadblocks might be coming forward, whether it's, um, you know, just a general, as, as we talked about, learning how to learn online, you know, that kind of thing, versus um, uh, what kind of temperament they have for for working independently, for working uh, without that sort of constant supervision, uh, a constant meaning in a face-to-face -face classroom, what happens typically in a face-to-face -face classroom. Was there something else in particular that that's a, you know, pretty global? Yeah, so one, one thing that came to mind is, is we conducted a, a research study at an independent, an independent study supplemental program, and we uh, surveyed students at the start of the course and actually the survey we used, we kind of modified from that research, but we had a list of uh, types of support. And then we asked the students, you know, do you feel like you need these? And if you do, who is gonna provide that for you? So we're kind of trying to measure that up front before they even started the online course. Um, and then we did it again at the end. And, and one thing that we found is that uh, just because they thought that they uh, we're going to get support from their parent or from a, a local teacher doesn't mean that that actually happened, right? They, it didn't really go that way. Um, and so I, I think if you gave them a survey and you kind of had that conversation, like these things are things that, that will probably benefit you, who's going to do that? And then check in with them again and say, you know, how is that going? Who's, who's providing you with the support? What do you need? I think it needs to be more than just um, at the start of the, of the course. There's also a, um, a discussion that we had at uh, ISTE, a, a conference in, earlier in the summer, and someone um, in a group that we were in was talking about asking the right questions. And I think we sometimes make a, a mistake in terms of asking students, for example, um, what's working well for you? You know, if it's working well, they may not really be thinking about that, but what is frustrating to you? What isn't working? And which, as as we have reported, we got a lot of feedback from the students about what was frustrating to them, and that was, you know, the length of time it took for someone to respond to them. Again, because they, I believe because they're used to having someone there in the room with them, and so it's a huge transition to have to wait for um, someone to give you um, feedback on a, an assignment, even if it's just 24 hours. It can seem like forever if if you're motivated and your you know your creativity is a, is at its peak, or you're you know you're really working on those algebra problems, but you can't you know get your one question answered. So I think that's another thing that we need to pursue. I, I like the idea of, of clarifying what people's expectations are. So what does the student expect? What is a reasonable time to to, to wait for feedback and, you know, how can I get immediate answers um, it, on particular things? What, what is the most frustrating thing for you when you can't get an immediate answer? So I think it's about, uh, you know, asking students um, more questions about what they would change and what, you know, what would um, make their, their student lives easier what is most frustrating to them, even though that's sometimes hard to handle when, when you get a lot of, you know, criticism for, for your system and your structure, your organization, but um, they're, the, they're the customers in a sense. And, um, you know, we don't always do a very good job of, of uh, listening to their feedback. I think this is a beginning. Becky, some of the things you mentioned in there dovetails nicely into my last comment that I had. And, and Jared, you were talking about sophisticated systems that could do a better job of alerting. And one of the things I was, I kind of wrote down was, you know, what, what would automated message triggers look like? Um, and, and what would be the templates you would might want to have in your system? Some of them, for instance, might just be certain relationship kinds of um, mm -hmm messages that might be automated that could go out that ask certain, you know, throughout the different phases of the, the semester questions that might be pertinent, but also the areas of frustration that we heard tended to be around issues of, you know, I, I'm ready to move on and I, I haven't gotten a grade back or an assignment back. And, and from what I know, there, there are some cases where the, you know, not having the assignment graded would prevent you from moving forward, but not necessarily a lot. So, 
I wonder about, you know, if systems could be built so that they were smart enough to know, hey, you know, an assignment hasn't been graded, it's been whatever, 12 hours, 24 hours, whatever it's been, that the system would automatically kick back out a, 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 a rec you know, something in this is my thinking, mm -hmm. you know, recognition of your status. Hey, we understand you've submitted a, an assignment, it's not been graded, you know, at this point, keep in mind. And then like, how do you move forward? So what are the, what would be the prompting? Keep in mind, you could move on to the next assignment. You could go back and re, you know, study some other pieces of it, but what might be those little tools that can get the student unlocked to continue their learning progression without um, needing to have necessarily a, a shorter, dura shorter duration and, and which this, the teacher feedback comes in. And so I, I think that that would be an interesting area. You mentioned there's lots of areas for research still to go, but that was one of the questions or thoughts that I had about, you know, I wonder how that field is gonna mature and what the research is gonna be done in there to kind of think about not necessarily bots, but just an automated processing of, of messages that could help to unlock student potential. Or, or if there was a way for a student to alert the teacher, basically saying, hey, I, I'm stuck, you know, an, an easy way where they don't necessarily have to send an email because some students were, were unsure of their ability to communicate online. And so if there was an easy way to do that. Um, but but I, I love that idea of of using the behavioral data or the analytic data, and if someone hasn't logged in for a while, to automatically send them a message where it appears like it's coming from the teacher, you know, saying, hey, insert student first name, you know, uh, notice that they haven't logged in a while, what, what can I do to help you? Where they can, it looks like it's coming from the teacher, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be something that the teacher types up individually. So Christine mentioned an icon shows up. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think that there, so what's interesting about what Joe's saying is, is it feels like there's systems for the teacher, but there aren't as many um, systems for the student to kind of know what, what's going on, have they been forgotten, um, that type of thing. But just kind of noticing them, recognizing, hey, uh, we're working on this. Th those types of emails are really, really helpful and, and helps to build trust with, with the student. I think, um, like with Christine, so she's talking about this, the icon. I'm wondering, though, where this might come up, besides when a student is in the middle of a of an assignment and doesn't understand it and they can't move forward for as long as you know it takes the teacher to respond to something that they don't understand in that moment but i'm not i'm not um, how do the the systems work when there is you submit your like unit um assi your unit assessment or something like that that it was a big you know project and that has to be graded before it can unlock the next unit those are the um, i think some of the things that the students when they were saying that that 24 hour and I can't move on type of thing, that's where that comes in is, um, are they able to submit their final project for unit one and then move on to unit two without it being looked at? Or does that have to be unlocked for them and those types of things? And what are some systems that might be put in place for that type of waiting? Well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much again. Um, we are going to have to wrap up because we're hitting the five o'clock hour. Uh, just wanted to say a huge thank you again to our presenters, Jared, Shawana, and Rebecca for sharing your work with us today. And a very happy birthday to you, Shawana. While we know this webinar was a very important part of your birthday celebration, we hope you have some more fun in store <laughs> this evening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what um, we're showing right now is that there are a number of ways to connect with us at some upcoming conferences, um, including here is INAC Hall. We'll be there for the research pre-conference October 21st. That's on the Sunday before the actual conference starts. Um, this is uh, the research conference or research community meeting, so it's free. Uh, so if you are going to be at INA call, please feel free to join us. It's from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we'll be joined by uh, Saro Mohammed from the Learning Accelerator. Uh, Joe Friedoff will also be at the Quality Matters Conference from October 30th to November 2nd in St. Louis. 
And then we'll also be at the Society for Information Technology and Teacher Education or the site conference in March, Las Vegas, and as well as the Digital Learning Annual Conference, April 1st through the 3rd in Austin, Texas. We hope to see you at one of these. And if you are interested in keeping up with the latest webinars or anything else, please email us at mvlri at mivu.org or join us on Facebook, Twitter, and or LinkedIn. The links are here and I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you so much again. Thanks everyone.